This here is a 12 gauge musket ball. It's made of lead and these were fired from the matchlock muskets in the English Civil War period. We did some experiments and at 50 meters into dry sand, we fired the shot and this is what we sieved out. As you can see, it has changed shape quite dramatically. So you can imagine the amount of damage it would do to a person. The wound would be probed with a probe like this into the wound and you'd root around to find where the musket ball is. You would then open the wound using a spatula with the probe, so to open up the wound. Then you would get a pair of bills, these ones are duck bills, and with that you would go in and that will fit the musket ball quite nicely to draw out. Of course, what you can do is one tool would do all the jobs together and you'd use a bullet extractor. This acts as the probe where you can actually work out where the shot's gone. When you've located the shot, you can then turn the handle at the top and in the bottom, a screw comes out and screws into the musket ball and then you can extract. Now, a lot of people think this wouldn't work. The trouble is though, modern lead has what is called antimony added to it during the smelting phase, which actually makes lead harder today. And this was done from 1900 onwards. Pre-1900, there was no antinomy added into lead, so our lead musket balls would actually be a lot softer than if you use modern lead. And the unantinomy lead would actually be able to penetrate with the screw. To stop bleeding, we'd use cauterizing irons. In a gunshot wound, you'd have one like this. It'd be heated up to it's red hot and then placed into the wound and then the burning would stop the bleeding. If in a large area, like an amputation, you'd get one like this one here with a flat area and you'd put this on the end of the stump to stop the bleeding. This is a digit iron. The blunt end is the surgeon's end and the extreme sharp end is for the patient. This will be placed on the patient's finger and then you hit it with a mallet. This is a dismembering knife. It's curved and the curved is always used point down. What we do is we push it down until we hit the bones and in a circular motion we go round the limb till we come back where we started. The skin and muscle is pulled back up the skin by the assistant to split open the cut to expose the bones inside. Bring your hands forward that way. We then get the bone saw. This is placed as high as possible in the cut, and then we saw through the bones. If you had a compression wound to the skull, and the bone is broken and pressed in, what you would do, you'd first of all drill a small hole as near as possible to the damaged area. What you would do then after you drilled the small hole, You'll get the trepanning bit, which is a circular saw. You'd put that, the spike, in the hole, and then you would turn and drill down. What you would do then, once you've got halfway, is you would get the spike and you'd remove it with a key. And then drill down fully through the skull. When that is done, you then get a second bit with the cutting edge is on the outside and the actual edge is slightly coned. You place that in the hole and by turning it, you will shave the edge of the hole to smooth it. You will then get the handle of a tool like this one here. You would go into the hole and it will start leaving up the pieces of bone. When you've done that, you would get a coin of the realm, because in these days, the coins are worth something and made of silver. You would hammer this out 
till it was slightly bigger than the hole you drilled. You'd file the edges down to make them thin and then you'll tap that into the hole. And within a couple of months, the, the skull will start growing into the silver to cover the hole. If you suffer from epilepsy, you would not put the coin in. You would just fold back the skin over the wounds and you'd leave the skull hole open and that would allow the bad spirits to escape and hopefully cure you from your epilepsy. Bleeding was quite common. This is the balance of the humors. And what would happen after an operation or if you were ill, we'd take blood from you, the idea being to make you better. But of course, a lot of people were quite worried about this. But our surgeons were very clever. We can do it in a very subtle way. What I do is I grab hold of your hand and I say, don't worry, you're in safe hands with me and I'll be a lying toe rag. Because at this moment in time, I could actually be bleeding you. The most common way to bleed someone was using a fleam, which is a very, very sharp, small knife. And with this, I would cut and stab you in different parts of the body, depending on your illness. It'd be used like a scalpel and the blood would, f would come out. If you wanted to just get surface blood, what we would do, it would do scarification with a knife like this one you would actually make lots and lots of fine cuts on the surface of the skin to allow the surface blood to ooze out. My personal favorite is one of these. What you do is, is you get the blade, usually I use the big one, you lay it on the area you want to bleed and then you hit it with a hammer. That way, when you twist the blade, you can control the bleeding a bit like you would a tap. Another way of bleeding somebody is by using leeches. This is generally used on rich people or on children. The leech can be placed anywhere on the body and its three jaws will bite into you, spit, and the spit stops the blood congealing and the leech will then drink the blood. This takes about 45 minutes to do. After that time, the leech will fall off. Uh, this is an artificial one, but of course we do have the real thing here. These are European leeches. We know they're European leeches because they've got green tummies. If they were orange tummies, they'd have Asian leeches. As said before, they have the two suckers. One is around the head and the other is around the posterior. And they move on land like caterpillars, but they can swim extremely fast. You generally find leeches always move head first. So that way, you always know which end is the business end. This here is a bleeding bowl. What happens is, is that usually you get lines on a bowl like this and you get measurements of how many fluid ounces you'll take from a wound. Usually and incorrectly, so many people say that this is a bleeding bowl. It's not, it's a shaving dish. This will go under the chin and so while you're being shaved, the soap and water would not spoil your clothes. There's even an indentation here in the corner here for your soap ball. But what could happen, because the barbers did dentistry, the chances are they used the same bowl when pulling teeth out, which stopped the blood and spittle going on your clothes. And this is why we think that this has been misnamed a bleeding bowl, not a shaving dish. Cataracts, as today, were a problem in the 17th century. And what we used to do in those days was couch them. You'd use a tool like this one here with a spike on the end. The spike could be pushed into the eye just behind the retina. And then the cataract would be laid down flat. The cataract would then dissolve. You would get floaters in the eye and you would see the floaters, but at least you could see. We think that with medicine, things always got better and better and better. That is not true. If you go back to the Roman times, they used to suck out cataracts using a tool like this one, which is a bit similar 
but it's slightly different and I'll show you how. First of all, you take the sheaf off the top to give you the couching needle to go in and loosen the cataract. You then put the sheaf over the top of the end here and you take out the spike. If you look closely, you will see there is a hole on the side. This would then go into the eye and what would happen is, is the surgeon would suck and the cataract would be sucked onto the tool and held in position by the suction and then the surgeon would remove the tool and with the cataract. Now bear in mind, this is a Roman tool. We lost the knowledge of how to remove cataracts by suction. And it wasn't until the 1950s that we started doing exactly the same as the Romans did. So this is an example of a timeline going worse before it got back better and we were back with what the Romans were doing. After an operation, the wound has to be closed and there are many different ways of doing it. One of the ways was by using a basic straight needle like this one here. The reason why it's so large is because we only put a few stitches in. And the reason why I put a few stitches in with big gaps between the stitches is so we can use tents, which are rolled up pieces of bandage that would go in between the stitches to keep the wound open to allow the bad elements to escape the wound. We believe the badness was inside the wound that had to come out, not outside coming in. Another way of sewing a wound together was bringing skin and muscle down together over the end of a stump, for example, and then you'd pin it like that, and you put another pin that way, and then what you would do with a figure of eight, you would go round the two ends of the pin, and that would keep the skin and muscle together. Each day, you'd clean the wound out, you'd leave the pin in place, and you'd make the figure of eight tighter and tighter and tighter to draw the skin and muscle together. Sometimes you had to keep a wound slightly opened, or you'd disfigure the skin. So if you had an open wound and didn't want it joined together, what you would do, you put a tube in the wound that way, and then the needle could go through the tube, like so, and that way you can then sew loosely fitting stitches. Another way of doing it is quite nasty, is using pins like this one here. You'd actually pin one side of the wound, and you'd pull the wound over, and you'll stick it in the other side. Not very nice, but a way of closing wounds. If you had extreme facial cuts and you were a lady, and we did any of those methods, what would happen is you'd have horrific scarring. So what they done is, is they got pieces of material like this here, cut into what we call dragon's teeth. This would be stuck to each side of the cut. Like that and then you'd sew the points together. And that way the skin is brought together and you do not get the same sort of scarring. We have here three different types of thread. We have gold wire, which would be used in hernia operations, because the gold wire will stay in place inside the body. And the idea being is it wouldn't cause infection. Most commonly we'd use linen thread Linen thread was used for most things in different thicknesses. Or we could use silks. Now you note the silk is red. We don't use black thread because the black colour has got oxidised dyes in with metal in them and they would rust and rot the thread. So you wouldn't use the colour black. For normally, for thicker wounds, we get the linen thread and we'd cover it in beeswax. And the idea being is is it being a natural fiber, fiber, is that the beeswax stops the material rotting. We now know that beeswax has an antiseptic quality to it, but it, at the time, we didn't understand this. So this was a secondary sort of by-blow that was positive for once. Rotten teeth belonged to the rich and the wealthy. Poor people either had teeth or had no teeth, depending on their diet, but it was the rich that had the rotten teeth. What would happen is, 
we believed is that when you ate the sweet meats, they stuck to the teeth. The tooth worm would smell this and go, mmm, that smells good, and would bore through the tooth to eat the sticky bits stuck on the outside. And that's what we believed gave you the holes in teeth. If you were rich or wealthy, we'd have to try and save the tooth. To do that, we'd use one of these, which is the tooth worm killer. You'd take the wire out and you'd heat that up till it was red hot. You'd place it in the brass tube to protect the mouth, place that up against the hole in the tooth, and then you'd plunge the end into the tooth to kill the tooth worm. Once that was done, you would then get a very, very fine needle file and you would file out the dead crispy worm from inside the tooth. After you'd done that, and this is why it's a very, very expensive operation, you would get this stuff. If anyone sneezes, I should get very upset. And what we got here is gold leaf. Layer upon layer of gold leaf is put inside the tooth until you form a plug. The sizing used for the gold leaf is actually, whoops, is actually the saliva of your own mouth. Once the hole is completely filled, you can then put layer upon layer of gold leaf over the whole tooth to keep the plug in. So the first gold teeth wasn't solid gold, it was layers and layers of gold leaf. Now, if by chance the hole was very, very large, you could heat the gold leaf very, very gently with a candle flame, and that would expel the oxygen that's in the gold leaf to make the gold more firm to stay in the, in the hole. Of course, if you couldn't find a barber that was skilled enough to do all this, or you didn't have the money to pay to have all this done, the only thing we could do would be to remove the tooth. You'll get a tooth pliers like this one here, we placed on the tooth, and you don't just pull out, what you do is you push in, you twist, and then it comes out easier. Now this tool is great for the front teeth, lower or top, which are the ones you're using, but when you start getting into the back teeth, it gets very, very difficult. So then we have what we call a pelican, which is a tool like this one here. What you would do is, is the plate would go on the tongue side of the mouth, and the arm will go on the cheek side of the mouth. If you imagine my finger is the tooth, you go in and as you pull back, you can capture the tooth inside the mouth. Then you can push, twist and hopefully lift out. If the tooth worm was too busy or the barber was too heavy handed, what could happen is, is the crown of the tooth would twist, snap and break off, leaving the roots in the gum. But don't worry about that, we've got a special tool for that, and it's called a goat's foot elevator. With this, I can dig out and pull out the roots that have been stuck in the gum by the breaking of the tooth. So at this point, I would say to you, this is probably the best oral hygiene lesson you're ever gonna have. Clean your teeth regularly like I do. I use wood ash and honey mixed into a paste, and I clean my teeth about once every three weeks. For everyday use, I use a toothpick, like this one here. And after every meal, I will clean out the bits between my teeth. But sometimes it's very difficult to get these toothpicks. If you go to a restaurant, they don't know what they are or they haven't got any. So last Christmas, my mother made me a bronze barley twist toothpick. I carry this with me wherever I go so that after every meal, I can clean out the bits between my teeth. My mother hates wasting money, like most mothers do, and so she insisted the bronze smith made a spoon on the end, so that when I'm cleaning my teeth, I can also clean the wax out of my ear at the same time. My mother is a very practical person.